Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jane Estes, and we're so happy you're here. This is our studio audience, everybody, and I'm going to give some introductions. Thank you for joining us online. Um, a couple of things. One, um, if you have not been here before, welcome to our bookstore. We're so thrilled that you're here, and we're very excited about this event this evening. So, um, we are having um, Dana Knox Wright here talking about holding on loosely, opening my hands, lightening my load, and seeing something else. And she's going to talk to us about that with Reverend Aurelia Davila Pratt, who has an upcoming book in September, stay tuned, called Brown Girls Epiphany, Reclaim Your in Intuition and Step Into Your Power. Um, and you can get it at a bookstore near you or one you're actually sitting in. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't been to our bookstore before, we're so happy that you're here. And we, community is a really important piece um, of our business model here. And we are so happy to throw the doors open and um, welcome everybody. And we get to have conversations and we get to have interesting conversations. And um, it's because of authors and moderators and the audience that we get to keep doing what we're doing. So let me introduce our guest today. Dana Knox Wright began letting go of fear at 50. It's the decade where, in an odd twist of fate, Sandra Bullock asked for her autograph. The de decade she began hiking to places with seriously wild animals, rafting in crazy rivers, and eating wild blackberries with only mild concern that rabid foxes eat from the plants too. After a long career in radio voiceover, she found a passion for spreading goodness and for living to the full. She's offered readers encouragement, hope, and sisterhood um, for almost 10 years through her essays published on her website. Dana holds a degree in journalism from the University of Texas at Austin and is the author of, as we said, Holding On Loosely. Also, lightning, um, Seeing Something Else and Saving Stories, Afternoons with Daryl. She's the mother of three adult children and is dubby to four grandchildren. I love that, dubby. Uh, um, she lives with her husband and an English mastiff named Pearl in a small river town in the Texas Hill Country, and they enjoy summers in northern New Mexico. We can talk about that later. Um, uh, Reverend Aurelia Davila Pratt is the lead pastor of Peace of Christ Church, a radically loving community in Round Rock, Texas. She's also co-host of the Nuance Tea Podcast, a contributor for ProgressingSpirit.com, and the author of A Brown Girl's Epiphany, Reclaim Your Intuition and Step Into Your Power. And you can find her on Instagram at Rev Aurelia Joy, where she is reimagining faith and theology via spoken and written word. So welcome our guest, everybody. Thank you for having me. So just a little bit, we're gonna they're gonna have a great conversation and there'll be time for audience questions toward the end, and then we'll follow up with a wrap-up and then you can shop a little bit. Sorry for you people at home, but you're in your pajamas, so we don't feel <laughs> yeah. that sorry. So, all right, you guys take it away. All right, thank, thank you, you, Jane. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you, and we were just now meeting in we're person. We're just meeting for the first time, <laughs> yeah. but I feel like I know a lot about you <laughs> yeah. from your book. Yeah. Um, so I'm so excited to chat with you, and I have some questions for you, yeah. but I think we all need to understand about the Sandra Bullock autograph story. Okay. Right? <laughs> I, I, I cannot move on. If y'all haven't seen her city, uh, her movie, A Lost, Lost City, it just came out, and I laughed the whole movie, the whole movie. Um, it's so anyway, I got to I got to know about you this. Gotta know about that. Well, so when I, I wrote a children's book called A Pigeon Tale and my illustrator and I traveled around Texas to elementary schools and it, some pre preschools in the area um, to do a musical sort of uh, uh, production of the book. And so we were invited to go to um, a, a, a preschool in the area. And uh, they did not, I knew, I knew the director. The director is actually my friend Natalie's sister-in-law. Oh, she, I don't know if I should have said that because they keep it really nice for Sandra. And people <laughs> that go there, so nobody knows. And, and I did not know. And we were there and her little boy at that time was at that preschool. And we were set up in the foyer uh, and she just be bopped in. And just like, just look like all the other little young mamas there and took our little boy and then came back to the table and said, I'd like to buy a book. 
and would you sign it to my son? And so <laughs> anyway, I did. And so that's that story. I love yeah, that. that was fun. I love that so much. I've been yeah. wondering since January <laughs> and I've been waiting to what? ask you about it. How could it. that happen? Yes. <laughs> Well, I do have some questions for you, but I wanted to start with a quote from uh, your book. And yeah. it's my favorite quote in the whole book. Oh. Uh, page 142, you write, you and I have the power to lay waste to a person's dignity when we judge them. Yeah. And um, I've just loved that so much because I do believe our actions have power and our words yeah. have power. And I feel like with this book, you used your power for good. Yeah. So I just thank wanted you. to say thank you for for that and for um, just expanding our own our own sense of dignity yeah. through such a yeah. helpful book. So yeah. thank you so much. That chapter was um, that chapter was a hard one because um, faith and church have played a lot uh, have been important in my life, and uh, I have felt, as I say in the book, supported and loved and uh, taken care of by the church families that I've been part of. But to be part of a church at a certain time in its history where judgment was part of it. And so that was that chapter was actually talking about judgment and how um, sometimes we can put rules over over love. And about a vulnerable young woman, that's that chapter um, that was in a difficult time in her life. And we, we offered her judgment and, it, and I, and I had a role in that. And so um, it's really, the whole book is just coming to, to grips with the things that I've held on to that I, I, I need to let go of and I need yeah. to, and, and what that brings to me, not only to the person who, um, you know, we're able to find healing for that person, but also for me. Yeah. yeah. I, I loved that chapter and yeah. I don't have a question for it, but I, yeah. I really, uh, you talked about a lesson you learned yeah. in such a, a hard way that stuck with you and involved yeah. courage and yeah. regret. And yeah, yeah, it yeah. was, it was really meaningful as also because yeah. you did talk about church and yeah. So many people have been wounded yeah. in church. Yeah. So I thought it was a really redeeming yeah. story. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Okay. So in your author's note, you write, this is my history of holding on. And these are my stories of turning loose. And you also mentioned the importance of having lived a good chunk of your life yeah. before you would have been able to publish this, this work. And um, I'm just curious to hear more about how the collection of stories finally came to be. How did this book come to life? Um, yeah. Were there any aha moments? Yeah, well, I, I wasn't really intending um, to write uh, a book about this. Um, after we went through what we call the Great Humbling, which is chapter one. <laughs> and if you've read the book, you, you kind of know what that's about. But I don't want to, that was the chapter that sort of launched me into thinking about this idea of walking, uh, walking differently in life, walking, holding things like this rather than like this. And um, could it make a difference in that story? It did, but things were sort of wrenched from my hand in that first story. And I thought if I could just now, if I could walk a different way and if I could purposefully walk like this, yeah. what kind of difference would that make in my life? And so, um, you know, after we sort of saw the kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, I had, and I always bring this any, any time I do a talk and these are just two little words that were, this is an old school flashcard and I had it at my desk and these were two words that, um, I really kept thinking there's just more to see. I need to see something. I need to, I need to see something, you know, in the stories around me. And I started um, I started blogging and they were just stories. They were stories and I wasn't, I don't even think I was really sure of what necessarily the meaning was. I don't think I saw the full connection of all of them for some years. And so the stories are not in any chronological order in the book, but um, some of them were written, you know, sort of right after the great humbling. And, and only then did I, it took me some years to connect, you know, it was about a four or five year, uh, project. Wow. And just, you know, when I had time and uh, my mother 
was ill during the middle of it and I put it away and wasn't sure I'd ever pick it back up again. And, um, but, but that's kind of how they came together. And I thought they would be mainly, uh, you know, for my kids that maybe I would show them to my kids. You know, I just had a few readers at the time on my blog, but I thought my kids would know me in a different way. I wanted them to know me in a, in a deeper way and know the things that I thought about, um, they were, they had already flown the coop by, by then mostly. And um, so I think it kind of started out as that. And then all, you know, and then it just kind of sort of, as I thought about it, just kind of fell into this under this umbrella. Wow. And now they have it bound. And they, they have it bound and they all, they all read. Um, there's a chapter really about them and they're mentioned in there. And I sent it all to them to have their blessing before I, before I put it out there. So yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I did have a question about your children because you do mm -hmm. talk about them. You at least reference them. You mm -hmm. have a chapter where it's really for them. Yes. But you reference yes, them. And a lot. Yes. Uh, often. Yeah. And I took away so much as because I have a six year old and I just sent her to kindergarten uh, this oh, year. Yeah. <gasps> and that was like the biggest turning loose so far for me. Yep. Um, but it was also a reminder that you know, parenting is just a series of turning loose over and over and over again. Yeah. And so I really learned, I just was grateful for your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess in that sense, I was wondering if you, if you could share anything with parents who are still in the, the muck of it with young children, what that would be. Yeah. Well, I'm looking and, and, and well, I don't know who's there. Who's here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know where to look here. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know exactly who's looking here, but yeah, I think just the fact that knowing, you know, that I, I felt like they, they're, my kids were my greatest gift from God and that I get to steward them for that time in life, for those, for those years. And then they, and then they move on and just, I think realizing just during the, those years, there's so much. I mean, anybody here that's raised kids, I mean, you're busy. You're making a living. You know, you you don't really have um, sometimes the time to focus on, you know, you're trying to get dinner and get the kids in bed, mm -hmm. you know, because they need a good night's sleep <laughs> before school starts. And yes. so, you know, I, I think in some ways it's just maybe the stories are maybe just letting someone know that this is the way life goes this is what it is. And maybe feeling like a sense of just a, a sense of mamas around you, you know, that have already done this yeah. and that are there to, to kind of, to kind of, uh, you know, in a way, give you, give you a hug and go, it's, it's okay. Yeah. And there's good stuff coming. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I love my adult kids and I, and I'm just every, every stage is something new, every, every stage, yeah. you know, and then, and then they bring his grandchildren and that's a good stage. And so I think if anything, those stories about motherhood and laughing, you know, as we as we get older and our adult kids give us a, a hard time. Sometimes there's some stories in there like that, um, that hopefully you will come away with just feeling encouraged. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 There was a lot of like heart wrenching yeah. moments that were so beautiful they were painful almost and yeah. just knowing that time flies yeah that's, it does that's how it goes and that's how it goes yeah yeah well yeah. one of my favorite things about your writing is how you pluck out these ordinary moments and you kind of name the beauty and the lessons in them and i'm thinking of your husband's whistle and your mm -hmm. your mom's sign mm -hmm. about the roses yeah and i guess i'm wondering if you have a favorite ordinary moment that changed everything, whether in your book or um, elsewhere? Well, that changed everything. There's like you, I think you said in the first chapter, like it, nothing changed and everything changed from that yeah. whistle. Yes. Um, from, yeah. From that. Well, I just think it was eye opening. I think I started really looking at that point to think I don't want to whatever hard I have to walk through again in my life, I don't want to walk through it like I did then. Mm. You know, I want to walk, and that's what changed. And um, I think it's it's a lifetime endeavor to um, this this turning loose of things. I, I feel like our whole life is hold, turn loose, and repeat. 
which is a kind of a mantra in the book, you know, and our whole life is that. And I feel like when we learn that, you know, when we, when we learn it or live it, it be, as a practice, you know, it's a reminder to me. I always, I say this jokingly, my husband, you know, I, I was, had a concern about one of the grandchildren recently. And my husband said, uh, go read your book. <laughs> so it, it really is just you know i don't think it's it's not a one and done thing it's not a cure there's no yeah. cure for learning to hold on loosely but i feel like i'm aware of it now that when i can feel certain things happening like you know i, I clenched my clenched stomach or whatever i know that there is something that i'm i'm i need to yeah i need to let go of something you know i i think about um that the book, if it if it could fall under an umbrella of scripture, I'm I am a lover of scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a theologian, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm just an ordinary person that has found great guidance in my life through mm-hmm. scripture. And um, so, if there's an umbrella that the book could could go under, it would be Ecclesiastes three. Mm-hmm. And if anybody is here listening that's not a reader of scripture, uh, the, the birds sang about this in the 60s, turn, 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 to everything a season and um, a time for every matter under heaven. So when I think about a time to be born, a time to die, a time to mourn and dance and plant and pluck up what's been planted, you know, I think that we we walk right down the middle of those for our whole lives, for the, for the most part. I mean, some people say it a different way, live your dash, you know, that, that kind of thing. But I feel... The answer for me is that by walking a certain way and and holding on loosely, um, it does change the way that both of those things happen, the mourning and the dancing. I mean, it it really, um, it, it changes the way that you walk. And, you know, I think from the minute we're born, we, we start taking on layers and layers and layers of of stuff it can be tangible stuff it can be the all the chapters in the book which are expectation judgment prejudice um, um uh, i'm trying to think of some others because i'm drawing a blank there's 33 chapters <laughs> there's a lot. anyway uh we take on these things we layer these things on and it weighs us down when we walk that way if we walk that way, you know, I'm 62 years old. That's a lot. That's a lot of weight to carry. And I don't feel like we were meant to live that way. When we when we live that way, I feel like we have less of all the things that we really want. Love, hope, joy, um, peace. And we have more of the things we really don't want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was good. <laughs> That's my, I don't even know if I answered your question, but... <laughs> I, I would gla- <laughs> if you didn't, I'm glad you didn't. Okay, <laughs> that was very good. Um, I really appreciated your chapter turning loose of a paradigm. Yeah. Um, I actually, if you go like on my website or something, I always describe myself as a paradigm shifter, and yeah. I feel like um, it's just the practicing and awareness that we all live within limiting paradigms yes. and there yeah. are always new ones we can be stepping into is yeah. so helpful. Yes. Um, so I'm curious what kinds of paradigms you've been turning loose lately. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Let me think about this. Um, gosh, I, I think thinking about what I thought and I'll go back to mothering again. Uh, what I thought it would be like in these years, what I thought it would look like has shifted. Um, you know, my, my kids are uh, far away. And, um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't see things all the time in the same way, which has happened a lot during the years that we've just gone through. Uh, these last couple of years. And, um, you know, I, so to remain in, um, you know, relationship with our children during this time and to keep an open conversation and, and just the fact that that looks different. You know, I think when I was younger, I thought my kids would just be carbons of meat, right? <laughs> that they would just, you know, and that's not always the case. 
and they they grow up and they're their own people. So I think seeing that, seeing how that that you know, and and it's and it's I have you know great relationships with my children, but I don't think it's exactly how I imagined it to be, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that I guess is an ongoing an ongoing yeah uh, shift yeah yeah always something yeah always something yeah. Um, so there's a thread of openness and acceptance throughout the book. And I really feel like it's just you, like you yeah. are an open and accepting person. Yeah. And I'm curious what made you that way? Were there experiences or people in your lives who shaped you to be this open, accepting person who looks on the world with, with curiosity and generosity and compassion? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I just, I think I was, I, I guess, I mean, as a, I, as a middle child and I throw this out a whole lot in the book and I can see my younger sister just rolling her eyes right now. <laughs> I, I don't know that she's watching, but if she was, she would be rolling her eyes. Christy, you know, you would. And, uh, but I think as a middle kid, you, I, I felt like a, a peacekeeper all the time in the family. You know, not that not that we needed a peacekeeper, but I'm just saying I always, you know, if my older sister would say, I'm going to run away from home, I would worry that she was. And so I would want to do all the things that I could do to be extra nice to her because I didn't want her to run away from home. I I have that memory as a girl, as a little girl. (laughs) And so I don't I mean, I don't know. I like to see. uh I don't know. I, I gen I just genuine believe and my mother was, my mother was a very positive person and did have so much um, influence in my life that way. And she lived through some hard circumstance in her life. And uh, it, it really was just amazing that she was as good a mother as, mm-hmm. as she was. But so she, of course, was, was a, a big influence in me. And I think always seeing the good, you yeah. know, she always saw the good yeah. in people and situations. Yeah. Um, this is such a tangent, but are you familiar with the Enneagram at all? Yeah, I'm I, curious if I, you know your number. I am, but I, you know, I want to know it. It's not, <laughs> it's not that I, do, I, I don't want to do it, but it's all the rage and the number people. <laughs> yeah. And um, no, I, but I don't know what I am, but I'm very much, you know, people that have known me for a long time. I, I think I fit in many ways like an, an extrovert, but I'm not an extrovert. Mm-hmm. I really, I, I, this is my size of group. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm, I very much um, feel like I get sapped from, from a lot of people, mm-hmm. not, not people, mm-hmm. not certain people, but just a group mm-hmm. of, a big group of mm-hmm. people. Yeah. And uh, so, no, I'm I don't so know. Care- what do you think I am? Well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Because you're not supposed to. People oh, okay. out there watching who okay. tell people what their numbers are. Okay. Um, but I did have a couple of guesses, which I won't say until later on after you've learned all about it. Because okay. you are a lifelong learner. Yeah. And yeah. so I feel like you're going to go listen to podcasts or buy a book. And then you're going to read about the numbers. And then the one that speaks to your gut, that's the one. That's the one. Um, but... You have to look me up so so, so I can we can know talk your, about this. I, I want to talk about it later. Okay, good. But um, one of my favorite things about you in the book is just yeah. that commitment to lifelong learning. And yeah. I'm, you know, like I told you earlier, I'm just a whippersnapper right now. <laughs> but I really aspire to be a lifelong learner. And um, in chapter 21, that's you talk about. Um, a, well, it's not on lifelong learning. What's it called? On chapter 21. What is it about? And I can tell okay. you what's the name of the chapter, chapter. You say, I'm thankful the world keeps changing on me and that it still manages to pique my curiosity. Oh, yeah. I can think of a couple of chapters. Chapter. That might I can't remember exactly yeah. which chapter that came you from. You say, I will not lie down and wait for the big sleep to come. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. yeah, I would guess I was wondering what practices and rhythms kind of in your life for lifelong learning are your are your thing are you listening to podcasts yeah. or what it, some people listen to podcasts some don't that's yeah I no I, I am a, that. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> a big podcast listener um yes and I also uh do do Venmo 
so I know how to do Venmo. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it just seems like small things. And I really do have the, I, I really do have the thought that I can learn things like I, I have the ability to learn how a cell phone works. I know I do. I just don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, there's only so many oh, things you can have time to learn and that's not one of them. But I also just think like, um, you know, just challenging, you know, challenging yourself and uh, it helps, you know, to have a partner in that, you know, mm -hmm. mine's my husband mm -hmm. and just challenging ourselves to, to get up and do something new. And I mean, even when it comes to music, uh, you know, one of my sons in particular, um, we share music back and forth. Okay. And I love that because yeah. he's decided, you know, he kind of likes going back to some of the old stuff now. And it's really fun to be able mm -hmm. to say, you know, that's not, that's a remake. The original was <laughs> 1975. Cover, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, you know, I think just things like that, yeah. that, that keep you interesting. I, I want to always have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I like love this. that. Yeah. I love that. And it was not just that chapter. The whole book was like that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so I really enjoyed that. So one of the most rivet, I'll say not my favorite, but definitely yeah. most riveting stories you told was about your turning loose of humiliation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that colliding with your Hollywood story, which you may have to share like a, a like a snippet of what that was about oh, the, the piano story yes yes um yeah but I'll just yeah. say like I just it, it's funny because I was I actually don't have a question here maybe you just need to share a little bit about it okay but I it was so I, I was hanging on every word and I was <laughs> angry for you but then I was also like so <laughs> proud of you at the end when you like went to the meal but then you know I just felt like you know humiliation and shame are so connected and that it is lighthearted as we're saying it now, like that's yeah. not a lighthearted lesson to learn. No, it is. So it isn't. Yeah, sure. <laughs> because it, it, well, the story, and I'll be really brief about it, but the story was, um, I, I taught, I taught beginning piano lessons and there's a huge difference in, in teaching beginning piano lessons and being a pianist. You know, I, I know music and I can teach. And in the little town I live in long before they get, Advanced, more advanced than I can teach, they've quit and they are playing baseball because that's small town America. And uh, so my daughter ha had a friend who was um, a uh, producer, director, I can't remember, but in film. And she called me up one day and she said, hey, uh, we're making this movie out here. And um, she said, would you play the piano? It's it's not even going to be. I mean, it. They just needed the sound of the piano playing, and it needed to sound like an you know old church lady playing the piano. I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> that I can do. And so she I, she told me the actress that was going to be uh, singing along, and uh, all of this to say there was one. I agreed, and I even listened to her, and she was a uh, you know she was probably in her seventies by that time. So think. Sophia Loren and think Betty Davis eyes and you kind of have this person and I'm not going to say who she is. And um, maybe later, maybe after, maybe one-on-one on one I will. <laughs> but uh, so the, she called me and she said, uh, would you, would you play and do this? And I said, well, sure. And then I, the lady, I saw that her age and I thought, well, you know, your voice gets deeper as you age. And so I even put it in some different keys, which was really stretching my skill to transpose. And we went out to this place and there's the crew there and she doesn't really know this song. There was like two hymns and a couple of Marilyn Monroe songs. It was a really quirky movie. I mean, like a C movie. Is that how they do on ABC movies? And, but it took premiere at the Paramount. And um, so anyway, I, I did this, but, but I was playing on this old Steinway and she didn't really know the songs and she had only known them the way they were sent to her with someone else playing them. And when I tried to help her along, because I'm a helper, <laughs> uh, you know, I was just being nice, as Texas girls do. And uh, we're playing along on the piano, and she looks at me with those eyes that were these just smoky. And she she also was, uh, had, a, had a, an act, she was an international actress. She had a foreign accent, looks to me and says, don't do that. 
<laughs> <laughs> she did not want me to help her. And so that, I mean, I just felt flush. And then, and then we ended up, it, it's a long story, but we had to kind of transpose some things. And then they ordered lunch and I couldn't eat because I was upset. I mean, just nervous. And then, and then I was just very quietly playing as they ate their lunch, trying to figure this transposing out. And she sent somebody over to say she, she would rather you not play. <laughs> and so this was my great humiliation. And I just wanted to bolt. And if it wasn't for my daughter's friend, uh, I think I might have. I really, I thought, I'll never see these people again. <laughs> what do I, anyway, the story worked out. I, I was humiliated, but I went home and then they invited me to come back to the set and watch them, the actors do their thing, which I did. And I'm glad I did because it was a new experience for me. Maybe not one I wanted to, you know, repeat, <laughs> but I learned a lot about oh, the whole process. But yeah. Yeah. I humiliation. Was so nervous is, the you, whole you were ner time <laughs> reading. Like it was just, it was. I felt so bad for you. I know. There's just nothing like that. I mean, we never get over that. I, mean, I don't care what age you are. We, you just, yeah, there's no good way, but just to go through it, which is what you have to do. You just got to go through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was true. Nice. Yeah. Well, on a more fun note, uh, another fun chapter, you talked about your adventures to Iceland. Yeah. I yeah, wish. I've always wanted to go there, but I'm curious yeah. if you have any other adventures on the horizon now that, you know, we're kind of able to travel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, probably not not abroad anywhere, but I was just talking about this to some friends the other day. There's so much here, you know, so much that we haven't done and seen in the United yeah. States. Yeah. So uh, my husband and I bought some e-bikes and so we're taking a few adventures on bikes um, this summer. Yeah. So, mm hmm. Like, so riding the bikes long distances four days. <laughs> and I will tell you, my friend Natalie said, okay, and now I need to ask you something. What do you do with your stuff? Where's your stuff? Like, where's your, yeah. where's your stuff? <laughs> and I said, well, it's in a small pack on the back of my bike. And she goes, all right. Well, and so she said, I'm just curious to see how it, how it's going to go down. It, do you still have a blog? So, we'll all keep up with yes, your I'll, adventures. I'll, I'll yes. <laughs> Yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, okay. So my two of my favorite chapters were Turning Loose on Hurry and Turning Loose on Time. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. I love Those the Those sound time. similar. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I was curious yeah, what your favorite related. chapters are. I Well, that the one of Turning Loose of Time is one of my favorites because mm -hmm. it was, uh, well, it was just, um, again, talk about being a learner learning about mm -hmm. this this family and um so the story is the uh, of a, an elderly woman in new york city at a pizza joint who started staring at me and we were real quick trip there and you know you just want to drink it all up and go do your thing but um she kind of drew me in to conversation and i gathered she she probably had some memory issues she was with a caregiver and um so the whole point of that was it was it was 30 minutes tops, but a time well spent. So the idea about this is we our time passes anyway. Mm -hmm. Our time is passes. We can't get it back. Mm -hmm. So when we give it to somebody, it's the most valuable thing that we can give to them. On the other hand, you know, if it, it and, and the idea is to make it count. So turning loose of time, the idea of just laying it on the table and see who comes to pick it up. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of that mm -hmm. idea of time. And uh, the woman, um, her name was Rena Schwimmer and her husband was um, called by uh, the prime minister of Israel uh, that he was the single most uh, important person in the independence of Israel. It was after the war and he smuggled World, World War II armaments that the U.S. had. You could buy an airplane for $5,000. And he gathered up these pilots who had just come home from the war that were, that, that were Jewish. And he felt like there would be another Holocaust if he, if he didn't do something. And so he smuggled these planes into to Israel to help arm them. And um, it's the most wonderful story. He got, you know, he was wanted by the FBI. He got 
And she lived those stories with him. And so like on that day in New York, she gave me all these crimes. Uh, some of them, uh, she thought he was still alive. Her husband he had been dead for five years. But just the thing when you lay your time on a table and you decide, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not really mine, you know, and, and, and this is what happens. Mm -hmm. These people cross your paths, which is what the book is. I mean, it's 33 stories of my intersection with a lot of people that never even knew that they, they yes. told me a story in one way or the other. Yeah. And, and that way I, I look at these as really parables. I believe that the Holy spirit still, uh, speaks to us um it through through story mm -hmm. through story Absolutely. and and for me this was this was the lesson of mm -hmm. of holding on loosely mm -hmm. yeah it made me wonder what stories am i missing yes. and and because I, you remembered so many stories over the course of your life and maybe some you had written down years ago but i mean yeah. i i just thought yeah like I probably have all those same kind of wonderful, crazy you things do. happening, but I'm not paying does. attention. I mean, everybody in this them. room does. Mary yeah. Oliver, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure most of you may know who she is, the American poet mm -hmm. that passed away a few years ago. Um, she, uh, she has an, three uh, little instructions for life. And they're uh, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. Mm -hmm. And so, I, th I mean, it goes right along with see something really. Um, and you know, those little stories astonish, they astonish me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I loved it. I loved, I, I loved the story about the couple kissing at the same, there was a couple, uh, in a, the same pickup truck yeah. in the same stop sign and in, yes. in your small town. Yes. And anytime you got behind them at that same stop sign before merging onto the highway. Yes. They would kiss each other for years, like 20 years or something. It went, uh, uh, no, it probably wasn't 20, but I would say 10 <laughs> and, randomly. But and I, I feel like I would have never even noticed that. And now I'm like, okay, I gotta be paying attention. I well, if, you were, if, if you were in a hurry to get to town and they wouldn't move on and then you're right on their tail the first time that they kiss you, you wouldn't know and then yeah. go back about it. But, I love it yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah, that was so good. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, it's last thing, it's not a question, just kind of the last thing I wrote down here. And then we'll have, if you have any questions, um, then we'll do that next. But on page 121, you wrote, when on the outside it appears that things are diminishing, they aren't, not even one little bit, they're expanding. And I think that the lesson I learned from your book was very much in line with this, that turning loose so often sounds like or um, loss or maybe even feels like loss. Yeah. But the beautiful paradox is that in turning loose, there's so much to be gained. And yes. We're expanded. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for expanding our minds and hearts a little bit thank you tonight. Really and through your book. Thank you. I good, appreciate it. Good, good yeah. questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, how do you want to do that? We'll, we'll, if you have any questions, just shout them out. Well, I have one. I'd like to know, um, where you summer in New Mexico because yep. I used to live there. Oh, you did. Okay. Well, this is new for us. Mm. And, uh, so this time we're going to try to stay the whole summer, but we'll see, uh, north of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's northeast of Santa Fe, uh, on the, on the east side of the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. We're ready for cooler weather. We are ready for cooler. Where did you live? We lived in Santa Fe for two and a half oh, years. Oh, so yeah. right there. That's the biggest growth. That's the best grocery store to go yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was literally just saying in the car on the way here, I just want to go to Santa Fe. I've never been anywhere in the, the West that I want to go to the desert. It's, it it's got its charm. It really yeah. does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so funny. Any questions? I have not read the book yet, but I cannot wait. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I hope you enjoy it. It's really, really good. <laughs> how how long did you write the book, Dana? How long did that take? Um, it took a, about five years, mm -hmm. and um, it was. Um, a busy time in life. Like I said, I kind of in the middle of it, you know, I put it away 
and wasn't sure I pull it back out again. So it's a process, as you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to write your book? Um, less than that, because I kind of pitched the idea and then they um, they gave me a contract and yes. said it's due by this date. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. So then I had to write You it. didn't have the luxury of just taking your My good whole old time. idea was probably one chapter. You know, I had a chapter and I wrote I finished that chapter and was like, Oh, <laughs> It's all, like, that was all my ideas. <laughs> I bet you had plenty more. But no, it, they came. Yeah. I think the, yeah. a mantra I came up with was creativity begets creativity. It just yeah. keeps coming. If, yeah. and, and I was curious if you had yeah. a writing practice, if you wrote every day or, yeah. or what that looked like in yeah. general. Not for this book, just in general. Yeah. Uh, well, right now, I, I, you know, after I finished it, I just kind of was like, Okay. It's, I mean, it was a learning curve because I did, um, I worked with the publisher and editors on this one, which mm -hmm. I had not done on my other ones. Mm -hmm. And so I, it, there was a lot to learn. You know, I felt like I asked really not very intelligent questions sometimes, but I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I would say, you know, I, when I was writing it, I wrote every, almost every morning and I would Thank just you. turn my phone off and cover my, table with sticky notes mm -hmm. and try to put it in some sort of, you know, order. Yeah. And as I wrote, but that was, that was, mm -hmm. that was what I did. Yeah. Do but you, I'm oh, sorry. No, I, it's a weird thing though to write a book because yeah. Yeah. I think uh, nobody really understood, like, what are you doing? What, like, it's very, so you wrote your ideas on sticky notes? Yes. Like chapters. I love sticky notes. And, and, and they were just <laughs> all over my table. I took a picture of it because it's kind of pretty. Yeah, all the sticky notes on the table. Yeah. 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 I wrote oh, at yeah. my kitchen table mostly too before yeah. the sun came up. Oh, before the sun came up. Before I the... watched the sunrise many, oh. all four seasons. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. I mean, I did it because there was a kid. Yes, you had to. You had, <laughs> but you, you had it was to. Very beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, I didn't. I didn't do that. I know yeah. that you're. The getting up early is the way to go. Yeah. And I'm, if I had to pick, I would be a morning, you know, if I have to choose between a morning and yeah. a night, I would be a yeah. morning person. Yeah. But, um, but again, my kids were grown. And so I had a little bit more freedom in my day. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you yeah. have anything you wanted to share that you didn't or, um, something you wanted to read, like a favorite excerpt or, um, or something? yeah, you know, I don't know why I was thinking about this, the story today. Um, but maybe because uh, my two two of my grandkids are about to go back to Germany for the whole entire summer, and um, so the chapter on uh, the invitation, mm -hmm. the little girl. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, th I think that's why I was thinking about it today. And yeah. I thought, I don't know, maybe I'm supposed to yeah. talk about that tonight. But um, oh, and I just lost my place. I had that mark <laughs> my place here. I'll find it again. Um, but it is a. Um, if I can find my index here. Um, is called The Invitation. And um, so it's the story, it's a story that um, talks about uh, wondering, um, when do we start doubting each other and becoming fearful of each other? Mm -hmm. And that kind of launches us into prejudice a little bit. And um, so the story it talks about, you know, my grandchildren um, who met each other for, uh, the first time I have one grandchild that's very fair and I have two children that have grandchildren and darker skin. They, uh, their mother is, um, half German, half Sudanese. And, uh, she, my, my daughter-in-law looks very, um, Syrian. And at the time when we were visiting, there was this influx of Syrian refugees coming into Germany. And the time that we were there, um, was, um, when all of that was happening, we had, we had been there before and you could see from the time we'd been there before to the time we came, the difference in the, in, in the people that were in Germany and coming off and on, uh, off and on of trains with us. And, um, so it started me thinking when I, when I saw these pictures, I wasn't there when all my grandchildren met for the first time, but when I saw these pictures and they, it's like, they just instinctively knew that they were kin somehow. And I thought, when is it, you know, when does this come into play in our lives? When do we, when do we, they just automatically were drawn to each other. When do we start to distrust that? 
And, um, and so I kind of started thinking about, um, and then, and, and I write in there too, there was a, uh, I had a pen pal. Did anybody else have pen pals when you're in elementary school? Do you bring them? Yes. Yeah. You remember their name? I, I don't remember their name. Mm -hmm. I know they were from England. There you go. That's why you have an That's why I have an English for accent. talking in British. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had uh, mine was Mulawala Vaghalsa from uh, from Africa, and uh, I loved like he signed his his letters to me. My pen is up and my ink is dry, and my daughter in law's father. Uh, signs his letters in a similar way, not exactly that when we get letters from him. And so I thought that was interesting. But so I've, I, I've always, I think, been interested in, in learning about other cultures. And so I, I, I found a definition of um, a prejudice, um, having a preconceived idea of something that you have had no firsthand experience with. And so in, in that way, that puts us all in that category because we all have experiences that we have not had firsthand. But the, the story, the invitation in this story is um, being on a train with my, with my uh, two-year-old at the time grandson and, um, and my son and daughter-in-law, my husband and myself. And so I'm going to just pick up reading this. Um, uh, about them coming on board. And let's see, they took seats in front of us. And let me see, where did I want to pick up reading this? Um, okay, yeah, we'll just pick it up here. This little girl came on board and she was Syrian. And her mother uh, and her brother were with her. And her mother had her hijab on. And um, and we're sitting on the train and my little uh, grandson toddles up to her children because he's just, you know, they're big kids. And we become on their radar. And then she says something to my, my son. And she then loves the fact that he's American. And she wants to show off her English. And so she starts speaking in English. And she's just Miss Chatty Cathy. And just knows everything. And just, you know, her, won't let her little brother talk. And at one time, the mother uh, reprimanded her. And I, I knew my son had asked her brother a question. And the little girl answered. And the mother said something in Arabic, and I was sure that she was saying, let him speak for himself, which is what we would say <laughs> as a mother. And then she and I look at each other. We can't speak the same language, but she rolls her eyes. <laughs> and we know, right? We just have this word. We just know. It doesn't matter. We're mothers. And um, so um, I'm going to pick it up with um, the end of our conversation. Um Let's see here that despite our language barrier, we laughed. Each of us connected in the moment by nothing more than motherhood. She and her hijab and me and my ball cap. We were sitting close and breathing the same air and it was enough. I'm telling you, it is enough. It's all we need to be really okay with each other, to be close enough to see the parts of us that are alike. I can't remember who exited the train first, their tribe or ours. But before it happened, the little girl invited us to visit her family, to stay with them at their house in Malta. <laughs> she then told her mom she'd invited us. And her mom immediately spoke something to her in Arabic, which the little girl translated to us. My mother wanted me to tell you it's our way. We're Syrian and it's our way to invite people. It's how we are. And I thought about those words for a long time. It's how we are. It's how we all should be, isn't it? It should be the way of all of us. If we, uh, if we invited people unlike us to sit at the same table to share a meal, I guarantee it's where all prejudice would die. Her words reminded me of other words, ancient words. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. A sermon pouring out of the mouth of a precocious Muslim girl. What happened on the train that afternoon was the opposite of prejudice. I formed an opinion based on an actual experience, and I knew it was right. It rang true in the deepest part of me. When I let others come near, I see we are more alike than different. I see them as my kindred. I see us standing on common ground, and I found it to be a place where no prejudice can live. It's a learning that can only happen when we come out of isolation and go scouting for sameness. It's the only way I've found to unhand prejudice that tries to live in me. We can't be afraid to move toward it and set it right. On the train that day, there was an hour of peace perfected. 
ushered in by the curiosity of my two-year-old grandson, who is the most magnificent blend of American, German, and Sudanese. Quite fitting, I think. And maybe that's the answer. Maybe it's how we can turn loose of prejudice the minute we feel a tug toward it. Maybe we should look to the ever curious little ones and simply do as they do. Um, but that I think is one of my one of my favorite stories because, you know, I don't I we we don't think sometimes about the prejudice that we have in us. We don't think it, and then and then we we see a situation and we go, ha. Oh. And it's just seeing that sameness. And I think that's what, you know, I didn't realize that I even would look at these refugees a different way. And then there's this darling little girl there and her mother. And I'm like, ah, we are the same. We're the same. We correct our children when they, you know, and, and it was just a, again, a lesson of, of, of these people teaching me something that was, um, a good lesson for me. I won't, I won't forget it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. 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 I'm grateful to have you here. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Well, that takes us almost right up to the end. Um, so let me step over here and I want to thank our guests in the studio our audience. You can clap now. <laughs> <laughs> We're so happy that you came. And so, um, so from Larkin Howe in Georgetown, Texas, we want to tell you that if you want to help support um, authors and independent bookstores, there are a couple of ways you can do that. You can follow us, follow the authors on social media and newsletters. Um, you can subscribe to the, the newsletter event bright page, crowdcast page for us, and you'll get an alert whenever we have a new um, event that comes up, tell your friends, bring people in, tell your friends about the books that you love or the authors you met that had something so meaningful to say <laughs> tonight. And then we love shout outs too, but mainly just come see us. Um, and this was delightful. And I knew that you two were going to be like a little magical. <laughs> I just knew. Um, yeah. So we so appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And I, I thank you for supporting independent authors. You're welcome. Um, it, it means a lot to be able to go into bookstores like this mm -hmm. and be welcomed there. Yeah. So, yeah. You're welcome. We're so happy you're here and we're glad to see you guys. So good night to the people in their pajamas and then we're going to just mingle and shop around here and look around and visit. So yes. good night. Well, thank you.